uh, that's going to be our background, and you would need to have had some understanding of the book of Esther in order to, uh, for us to take this uh, justice leaders, developing justice leaders for the 21st century. That's our theme. That's what we're going to deal with. Man, it's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, uh, to carry this on. But one of the things that we've been talking about at the board level, this is a, this is a, as, a, as an association of equals coming together, people who are already doing Christian community development and those who want to be involved in Christian community development, particularly among the poor and the grassroots of our nation. And of course, the whole theme here in terms of these indigenous leaders, we're talking about developing indigenous leaders at the base level because we say uh, our society has been a, a society of, of, uh, of the strong dominating the weak and come in and colonize them. So the newcomers into society usually come with the technology, the skills, the resources, and they overrun and subjugate the people of the land. And so the idea of the good news, I believe that indigenous leadership development was inherited in the Great Commission. When he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every ethnic group, every tribal group where we find them, that we bring good news to them, not that we come in to, to subjugate you and take your resources and carry them back to our strong nation. That has been the pattern of life. Jesus told us to take the good news to the people in every ethnic corner of the earth and tell them that they've been created in the image of God and that their Savior has arrived. And he's concerned for them to manage their community, manage it for the highest good of the people within the land, within the nation. That's inherited in the Great Commission. We have left that off. And that we have, where the gospel had gone in my lifetime, I have seen all of Africa, with a little exception, been decolonized. And that we've got to finish the decolonization as we move in and carry the gospel so that people can stand on their own feet and they can learn how to manage their own resources and then make some kind of equal exchange with other people in the world. Justice, we're going to see, is a management issue. Justice is a stewardship issue. We're going to see this morning is how we manage our land and how we love our neighbors and how we bring them good news into society. So when Jesus said the idea of all of Christianity, all of religion, is to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and to love your neighbor, you love yourself. He was talking about your next door neighbor, but he was also talking about the next tribe. He was also thinking about the next nation that is joining to us. And we have this privilege then to bring this wonderful good news of God's love to these people of the world. And that's what we're concerned about. And that's what we want to learn how to learn how to do. Now, what is thrilling me, this organization is now, or this association is now 20 years old. And, and our core belief, my core belief, that human beings are created in the image of God. If I, I couldn't be standing here talking to you if I didn't believe that. Here I am, a black man from Mississippi, a third grade dropout, and that this organization have emerged out of mean learning among the poor people in Mississippi. I believe in the inherited dignity of the people with the problem. I believe if you come beside them, bring them the good news that they're created in the image of God, help them with their resources, education, that people have the possibility of managing their own lives. And to think that we've got to manage, this morning, this morning, the Greenspan acknowledged something. He acknowledged something very powerful, that he was operating on the principles that these banks and these management firms and these investment corporations they turned all the power over to them, and he was on the impression that they could manage themselves apart from greed. And they have brought the whole world down. They have brought the whole world down. 
but believing. And we see those greedy people. I see in the end is putting it up on the bulletin every morning. He's talking about these greedy people and how they have brought the whole house down. And Greenspan was operating on the idea that they didn't need no supervision, that they would be operate in the best interest of their company and the best interest. Why do you think those investment corporations were buying those banks off? Why do you think those money houses were doing all of that? And if we are not careful, this money house in Abu Dhabi will own the whole world, them in China because they are saving their money and investing it, and we are using all of us up in our society. So everybody needs to be out of, under somebody, and we need to be under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and that we need to be getting our message from him, and that we need to be obeying him. Well, I'm preaching to you this morning. But, okay, that's the point we're going to try to make. I'm, giving, I'm preaching a little bit while I'm waiting on all the people to get here to... To, to, to teach you. But, it, but in the meantime, uh, we have a, a book here. I'm not the only author of this book. It, these are the old timers. They laughing because they know I'm always pushing books. And Eula always pushing my book. But, but this book here is not altogether mine. Ron Sider, Wayne Garden, and Al, we wrote this book together. And it has to do with Lincoln arms, Lincoln lives. And the idea is how can we bring sensitivity to the suburbia churches and how can we bring, uh, as Leo said, how can we help the urban churches overcome their victimization and how can we join arms and our lives together to s zero in on the poor in these urban communities of our, of our nation. And this book is about how to, to do that. And so I would encourage every person who wants to link arms and want to have partnership, real authentic partnership, meet each other as equals, created in the image of God, and join together. This book here is a must for everybody. And even for the people you are working with, uh, the, your suburbia churches, or your support churches, or those people you want to get involved with you, I would suggest that you would get one of these books into the hands of their mission committee so they can understand better how to affirm people's dignity, not how to give people's dignity. You can't give people dignity. Just that thought is a word of exploitation. You affirm the dignity that was created in people in creation. They are created in the image of God. That means they have inherited dignity. Our job is to go in there and affirm that dignity and help them with the motivation, the education, and the skills they need to manage their own affairs. So this is, this is something that everybody needs to, uh, to, 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 uh, to get. This, what is impressing me, and what impressed me when I went to the, uh, to the new members gathering the other night, is something that impressed me very strongly was number one, how many of the young people were there. And what is impressing me as I go around to these colleges and universities, the behavior of this generation of young people, particularly this generation of young white Christian people. You would think that this generation looking at what's going on in our society would be getting afraid of people because white is no longer going to be the majority in America. The minority is going to be the majority when you put them all together. You would think that that would, create, that would create fear. But this new young Christian generation is reaching out with love and compassion. And as I went up there and watched the group the other night, this, this association here really represents the population. We have, we have equal population of blacks, more to the population. We have population, we are still majority white in our organization, that's in our society. But what is thrilling me is how this generation is reaching their arms around each other. And I'm seeing Hispanics, blacks, Native Americans, and even the, the Indian from India, and all of these people are joining together. They are not fearful. We got the possibility 
in our generation, at least the church can, witness to this whole idea of one nation under God with liberty and justice for all, that we could really, in fact, pull together and get rid of this fear of each other. You would think that people would be afraid, and I can see a little of that, can be afraid, and people are a little bit afraid uh, of, of, of the possibility of Obama becoming the uh, president. It is a little bit afraid. But boy, there are young folks and others who are coming together and looking at those people and looking at the policy, listening to what they are saying. And CCDA is not here really to endorse and to put a label on who is going to be the president. You know, that's not it. I saw this old hope personal that we could live out our creed and live out the hope that Martin Luther King talked about, that there would one day his children would live in a nation where we would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character in our society. That's the kind of world we need. That's the kind of church we need to be representing in society. In society. And so this is a great uh, time. And so now, because of... <laughs> Because of this young group of people who are coming and is so excited, we have updated uh, Let Justice Roll Down. This was a pioneering book for, and that was thrilling last night. When I went out there, when we first started this, it was just three or four books on Christian community development and how to, the tools. Last night as I went around there and saw all of those authors, CC Day have almost just spin off a whole new enterprise of people who are writing to help us. So you buy those books, buy those books. There are books on housing. There are books on different subjects out there. Get those books. Carry those books back to your organization and use them as tools to develop. This is all new. This is all a whole new movement, and God is raising up the tools. And the big deal in my last, before I get into my talk, <laughs> my last talk before I get into my talk here, is, is, the, um, is the idea of what happened 20 years ago. God brought together a group of us like Mary, uh, Mary Nelson and others, uh, and we formed. And uh, Pat, you was a part of those original early meetings that we had. Uh, and when we was thinking about forming the Christian Community Development Association, and God raised up from those organizations uh, us leaders who was already involved in that. And that we have brought this organization to this place. But now God is raising up new leadership. And that new leadership is represented really by, by Noel's, Castellanos, his leadership. And our job now is to shift this organization over to this present generation and hoping that we can raise up from this generation a new generation of young people who can take over this organization and then move it for the next 15 years and keep it relevant to the time. And it don't just become an old organization led by old men and women like myself and Mary and others. But our job is to raise up, is to raise up another generation of young people, but with the savvy, people who are concerned from the poor, and we want most of those leaders to be, not all of them, from the indigenous community. We always need outside people to keep us fresh so that we won't become just traditional and that we won't be, become captive to our own culture. That's what have happened to the church. The so-called black church, the so-called white church, the so-called Chinese church, the so-called Asian church, and all these Hispanic church, they have become captive to their own culture. And Jesus sent us across the culture barriers to make a new reality so that the world could know we was Christian because we had crossed those racial and culture barriers. By this may all mankind know that you are my disciples because of the love you have one for another. And that's what CCDA is about, and we're just so happy you're here. Now, you, you have your Bibles open then to um, um, Esther. What I want to do this morning Yesterday, I tried to develop a curriculum uh, for raising up indigenous justice leaders for the 21st century. And we took the original justice leader 
and use that person, Moses, as the model. Uh, leadership, shepherd leadership, biblical leadership, ought to be modeled after the life of Moses. Jesus himself modeled his ministry after the life of Moses. Uh, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, Moses said that God is going to raise up a leader like unto me. He was talking about from among you. He was talking about both leadership from the community. But as a prophet, he was also talking about the leader who would emerge. And that leader would be Jesus Christ, the great leader. So Moses himself is a model of a shepherd leader. That's why it took him, God, so long to raise him up. It took him 80 years to prepare Moses to be the kind of exemplary leader that we can look at. The Bible says that Moses was the meekest person on earth. And to think about leading those people who had been so damaged by enslavement, leading them out and forming a nation that was to be the exemplary nation. And so we use Moses as that model. And we looked at yesterday morning those principles that went into developing Moses. And that we, let's review those principles uh, this morning. Those principles went into him. We said, uh, first of all, um, uh, the family was the most crucial. And that's when I started my teaching, developing the curriculum. The family is the crucial issue. That's the crucial problem in America, is the family. And I suspect that if you would trace the aid program epidemic in Africa, I bet you could trace it back to the multiple wives and multiple sex and not obeying God's commandment of getting with one woman and staying with her until death do your part. I suspect that if you go there, you would see the family is at the heart of many of the problems we face. I know in America, our biggest problem, the end of our problem is the prison justice system. That's a wasteful institution that is taking too much out of our national budget and it have no value in it whatsoever. And prison is the absolute failure of the society. Prison just reflect your failure, our failure. Prison represents the church's failure because Jesus encourages us from the beginning to go to the jails. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to open the doors of the prison. And the judgment and the final day, he's going to say, did you go to the prison? Because the prison reflects our failure in, in our society. And when you look at the prison, who's there in those prisons, 97% uh, of those people in there came up primarily without a father in the home from the black community of America. And that we represent almost 70% of the prison population of America, which is absolute tragedy. But it comes out of that broken family. So if we are not dealing with the family, you are not dealing with justice in our society. So we talked, about, uh, we talked about the family. We talked about faith. And the only way you can get faith is through the Word of God. I heard it again last night. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We talked about purpose. People got to live with a sense of purpose. And our society, the reason we are in trouble today is because living by our instant gratification. We wanted those houses that it cost $150,000 to make and that we bought them for $400,000. And that's where the housing crisis is at. We bought those inflated housing uh, with, with, with borrowed money and we did not have the income base to support that and that we was exploited anyway by that in our society. And so faith, so we got to come back. And one of the things I'm thinking about in this the church has got to be the prophetic, not only our prophetic voice speaking to the future of people, but we need to also be able to display that in our lives. Uh, uh, being the voice of God, you've got to be both in terms of your future sight, insight, but you also got to be relevant to the day. The gospel is both uh, is, 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 is the love of God made visible. It's a demonstration of God's love. So people not only must hear about God's love from us, but they must see God's love lived out in us. We must be the good news to the people in, in, in the community. And the only way we're going to be that 
is put the Word of God back into our lives. See, the Word of God activates all of God's action in the world. By faith, we understand that the world was formed by the Word of God. And the incarnation of God on earth in Jesus Christ, he was the Word made flesh. And so we must go back to that Word of God. And then we look so, so, and, and then live our lives with a purpose. And we talked about yesterday about courage and how do we create the kind of activities that the young people can be served so they can become people of courage. And we talked about, a, and I won't talk much about this, we talked about a sense of identity. I think being a racist and a bigot is the biggest waste in the world. And I, I, I believe it takes away our joy. We can't enjoy all people. You know what I'm saying? So I don't even like that. Today, I don't preach too much on reconciliation. I try to preach it in a way to make us look stupid to practice it. <laughs> because that's the exact idea of what the gospel was supposed to deal with. It was supposed to reconcile us to God and reconcile us to each other. And if the gospel is not reconciling us to God and to each other, then we don't have a gospel to preach. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given you and me the ministry of reconciliation. So we talked about that uh, identification. Then we talked about how can we bring about discipline. And the only way to bring about discipline is to create a, a, a firm and loving pain in the lives of people. That's the crisis in the school system. The family is so broken, and the kids had no discipline. And we have not been able, to, uh, we concluded that whipping kids in school and beating them up was not the best way of discipline. But we haven't found anything yet to replace that. <laughs> and, 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 and so our schools from the ghetto era is out of control. And it becomes difficult then to, uh, to, to manage that. And one of my great burdens is to try to raise up young black men in just men's period to go into teaching elementary school, in the public school. Uh, uh, in, in the so we talked about that, and then we talked about being faithful. This morning, uh, what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about um, sort of a profile of a disciple and the profile of a disciple so that y'all can know what it looks like. See, your job now is to go back to the community and to raise up these justice leaders by applying these principles back in your community, knowing the problem and then using these principles, and that's the curriculum that I just went through. This morning, I want to look at a profile. What would that look like? What would that look like? What would that look like with these fatherless children? What would this look like back at the community? And what is our task? Well, this morning we are looking at um, Mordecai and Esther. This is the example. Now, they face the kind of problem we face. Uh, the reason they are in captivity, now Mordecai and Esther is in the Babylonian captivity. Y'all know that. Y'all are Sunday school people. You don't understand that. And they are in there because their leadership failed to obey God and to keep the sabbatical. They failed to manage the land, to be good stewards of the land. Their relationship to God depended on their relationship to the land and how they made that land prosperous and how they kept people enfranchised into owning their own land. That's what the book of Esther is about. That's what the book of Ruth is about in the Bible. But they failed. And because of their failure, they are in Babylon. They're in Babylon. And now God is going to raise up people. When God intended them to go down there, they were going to be disciplined for 70 years. They wasn't going to be destroyed. And God is going to bring them back. But what we have here is a conspiracy. And it's an Old Testament long conspiracy of those, some of those knights that they had exterminated when they went into the land. Some of those people remembered that. And it was a guy named Haman. And he was just waiting in that nation for the opportunity to exterminate and to get rid of those. Y'all know that story, Sunday school story. That's the background to our story. But God's protective hand is going to be upon them, upon that, up, on the people. And so they are down there in slavery. 
you know the whole story is that uh, uh, the king was having a big party and the queen would not come to the party. And because of that, he got rid of his queen and he needed another queen. Y'all know that story. And of course, uh, Esther was down there in the land and we're going to see that and that she is a Jew, and this is surprising, they did not want no Jew to be no queen. But she had kept that a secret, you know, and now she gets into this contest. But the great thing about this story is, uh, is Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is the professor. He's the discipler. He is the teacher. He's the one responsible for discipling her. You guys in here, all of us in here, we represent this morning, we represent the Mordecai. The information that we are getting here yesterday and today, we are teaching the Mordecai. Your job is to go back to the community and so disciple the people back there that they can be ready to take over leadership when the time has come for leadership. That's the whole idea. And so here we have a profile of a person. This person could not be no more broken than this little woman, uh, uh, Esther. Her mother and father both is dead. He takes her in as an orphan, okay? And the Bible says he raises her as he would have raised one of his own children. He loved her. He was there as that father she didn't have. And Mordecai's wife was there as the mother she should have. And so parenting becomes the most important element in raising up leadership. That's crucial, and that's what this mentoring is about. God has given us the spirit to do that. Yes, last night I was meeting people, and I was asking them, what are they doing? They're doing discipleship. They're doing mentorship. You are doing what God wants us to do. And let's go back to our community, and let's raise up disciples. We send us into all the world to make disciples, and making disciples is shaping people's moral character and stability so they can be the kind of leaders that God wants us to be. And so he raised her up. Uh, he discipled her. He trained her so that she could become the great leader. Now, let me tell you about leadership. Uh, leadership. Leadership that changes society. Leadership that affirms humanity and helps society to move on. The great leaders are people, listen to this, that enters into the agony and the pain of the people in their time at that moment. Those are the great leaders. You won't remember the leaders who had to have all of these retreat homes, all of these cars, all of these airplanes, and all they got there is now, and that's the end of it. You won't hear about them. The leader you hear about in history is the leaders who entered into the pain and the agony of the people and counted their own life unimportant, only important as they are trying to deliver the people who is in the pain. Those are our great leaders we remember. We can remember Abraham Lincoln, can't we? Because he entered into the slavery issue. It cost him his life. We can remember Franklin and Delano Roosevelt when the stock markets closed and people were jumping out the window killing themselves. He said, Trust me, in 100 days, I'm going to turn this thing around. In 100 days, he entered into, and I'm going to give you some work. He come up with the WPA and everything else. He was putting people back to work in our society. He entered in. We remember him because he entered into the pain of the people. We remember Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, he spent as much time in jail as he did in others because the society had failed. The society failed. He entered into the pain of the people. And I meet young leaders, young leaders that think just because you got a college degree and got a briefcase on a desk, that makes you a leader. You are not a leader until you lead. You are not a leader until you identify yourself with the agony and the pain of the people now. How do you have a Boy Scout troop? Are you teaching a Sunday school class? What are you doing? And I meet these guys all the time, these young politicians. They running for something. I ask them, do you have a Boy Scout troop? No. Do you teach a Sunday school back in church? No. 
uh, uh, what, do, you, do you have a Sunday school class? No. Why do you think I should make you my leader? Why do you think I should make you my leader? You, you know, leaders have to already be identifying with and lead the people into the pain. That's why we call it the felt need concept. The good leaders relocate and move into the pain of the people and identify themselves with them. And then the leader's job is to lead the people out of the problem that they face in, in society. That's important, young folk, as we raise up, as we raise up leaders in, in, in society. Okay, so let's take a look then at, our, at this leadership here of, uh, of, of, of Mordecai. Now, Mordecai, the plot is ready. The idea here now is that uh, they're going to kill all the Jews. Haman and got that set up. He's ready to kill them all. But you see, Mordecai enters into the pain. When he hears about this plot, now Mordecai is a great leader. He has already saved the king's life a long time ago. But the king don't know about it. And it's a funny thing if you read that. Read that. Evidently, evidently, uh, Haman was the, one of the chief uh, bodyguards, the chief detective was in that system. Because what happened was when they found out the plot, to kill the king, they, they elevated Haman. Mordecai is a guy who broke the plot, but they elevated the leader instead of elevating the person who really solved the problem. And so Haman is now in this great position, and he got this malice. That, that's why you look, folks. If you got something against somebody, you ought to get rid of it as quick as you can. I do that, I try to do that in my organization, and I don't create nothing but chaos in my organization. In my organization. Because whenever people find, when I find problems in it, I talk about it out loud to everybody. <laughs> because if you allow those things to stay there, they turn to malice. Malice. And once they, that's why Jesus says, uh, if you bring your gift to the altar and think about you owe somebody something and somebody has something against you, go to them right then and get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because it turns to malice. It turns to hate. It turns to get even with people in society. And so all that Haman thought about is how he can get even with the people. But this guy, uh, when Mordecai hears about it, he go into the streets, and he began to uh, moan. He began to protest, protest. And you wasn't supposed to, it was something unique, because Mordecai did have some important position. He could come into the king's court, and he was out in the courtyard, dressed in sackcloth and ashes, and moaning for his people. Now, by this time, Queen Esther is up in the, up in there, she have concealed her identity. She is not a queen, and that she is in the palace. And now Mordecai must call on her as the person to solve the problem. Now the key here is, is have he taught her right? Have he trained up this child in the way that she should go? That's what discipleship is about. Discipleship is about training them up now and in the time of need, being able to bring the kind of information to them to help them to make the decision, the decision, even if that decision caused their own life, that's the idea of leadership. The idea of leadership is to so disciple the lead that when they become leaders, they're willing to give their life for the cause of the people they lead. Let's see then what happened here as, as it happened. Mordecai sends a note. She wants to know, somebody tells her that Mordecai is out there and he's demonstrating in the street. And of course, of people demonstrating in the street, the king could get him, put him to death, there's nothing about it. And so she was concerned about Mordecai. And Mordecai was concerned about his people. That's what he was concerned about. And so she sent in a note. 
he sent a note. He said, we want you to help us. We want you to go into the king, and we want you to appear before him, and we want you to become our savior. You are in this place. And so let me read the text here. Yeah, it's a beautiful text here. Where we at here? Verse 13 of chapter 4. I want y'all to know all this is coming from the Bible. This is not just something I thought of. And we're going we're gonna to come up with the principles that he used in this discipleship that made her such a strong person here. That's what I want you to see. Is, is that we're going to see the proof of the kind of discipleship and see that this person is able to do what he has put into her. That's what leadership is about here. Now, let's see now. So uh, she didn't respond. And listen to Mordecai as he sent the beginning in verse four, uh, 13. This is the last letter he's sending her. This is the last information. Actually, he is concerned about her up in there, but he know he's on the side her. Now he's got to put in this note, and we're going to see that. He's got to put in this note, and we'll come to that in our principles, our qualities. He's going to put in this note something that's going to rally her, something that's going to cause her to rise up. And that's what discipleship is. He's going to put the truth in her. And when he repeats back to her the truth, she's going to respond. She's going to respond. And so let's look at him here. Here. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. You know, she done sent this letter that says, if I go into the king and if he don't raise up this raw rod, uh, only thing going to happen to me, he's going to kill me, and I'm afraid, and I don't want to die, and all of that. And he wants her to know that he done discipled her to not to see death of her own self as being very important. It's her people that's got to continue. It's her people. That's the kind of leadership we need. We need leadership that has a concern for the lead, not just concern for their own wealth and exaggeration. You're concerned about the pain of the people that you are leading. And let's look at this here, Mordecai, then commanded Mordecai, these are the last words here, then commanded Mordecai to answer Esther. Listen to this. Think not within yourself that you're going to escape in the king's household more than all the other Jews. She had lost her identity. She had concealed her identity so long. That's what happened to the 6,000 Jews that was killed in Hitler's Germany. Did y'all know the engineer of that whole thing was a Jew named Adolf Eichmann? He was so much trying to be a Hitler Nazi and to prove to Hitler that he was a Nazi, that he exterminated his own people. Boy, it's terrible to lose your identity. That's what happened to us in the 60s. The long enslavement of us as a people, we lost our identity. We thought that being white was the only way to do it. And so we did everything. We scotched our hair. We did everything. It wasn't until young folk began to let their hair dry out and be natural. It wasn't until people like Stoker Carmichael raised their hand and said, black is beautiful. And I want you to know black is beautiful, white is beautiful, green is beautiful, everything is beautiful. You all know my theology. My theology is that God loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They all are precious in his sight, and they all are beautiful to him because he made us all, and he made us all in his image. In his image. That's important. That's important uh, to know here. And so he says... Don't think that you're going to escape in the king's household. You are a Jew just like us. And when they kill Jews, they're going to get them all. <laughs> they're going to get them all. Somebody's going to tell on you. Somebody's going to squeal. And you're going to have to go too. He rallied her. To, uh, he says, listen to what he says though. But if you all together hold your peace at this time, this is crucial. And the biblical idea is when the opportune time come, take it. Now is the day of salvation. 
right now, we the church have an opportunity with a whole new administration coming onto the scene. And of course, you know how they've been dealing with the church. They recognize the, the idea. The church will actually, in fact, determine the election. That's what Caleb and all of those people are all about, is about playing for the church's support. The church is the deciding feature in America, in, 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 in America. They're going to use us, but are we going to be able to speak to them? Are they just going to manipulate us? You, under, you, under, you understand? And so he said, if you all together hold your peace at this time, and this is our time, this is the time for us to develop a church that is exemplary. Maybe this depression that is coming might be the kind of demonstration that we need in order to pull the church to what it his real place in the society, to pull us together and begin to serve each other and take care of each other, plant gardens together, feeding each other, clothing each other in our, in, in our society. We might have to go back. Our nation is not going to disappear. Our nation is not going to disappear. It's not going to disappear. It's going to depend on what we do. It's going to depend on pointing our people to a better way. It's going to depend on not people like Greenspan, thinking that people have something very good in them. We are fallen creatures. We are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way. And unless we have accepted that one who died on the cross for our sin, accepted him as our Savior and our Lord, not only as our Savior, but we must accept him as our Lord. That means we must follow him to do his will, not our own will. Uh, in the world. Think not within yourself that you're going to escape in the king's household more than any other. For if you all together hold your peace at this time, he says, then deliverance will come to the Jews from another place. But he says, who knows that God didn't put you in the kingdom for such a time as this. That was all she needed. That was all she needed. She sent him a note back and says, I'm going in. I, I want you to get some people out there. They don't use the word pray, prayer in there. They don't use the word God in there. But God's hand is over all of this. Y'all go to get together and y'all fast, and you know fasting and prayer go together uh, for them. And, and she said, I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm going in. This is the end of leadership. This is the end of leadership. This is what leadership was designed for. I'm going in, and if I perish, I perish. My people are more important than me. Leadership that have to have all of this stuff for yourself is not good leadership. Leadership, this idea of self-preservation is the first law of human nature. That ain't right. The first law of human nature is that we are concerned for our children. We are concerned for those around us. We are concerned for those who are going to take over when we are gone. That's the first law, is to be concerned. Now, let me go then and do my teaching this morning. This has been long. We've got, got five, do all this talking. <laughs> and, uh, this is a good introduction. This is a good introduction. Let, let me... Let me go now. Let me uh, let me go now and do my and do my um, uh, real teaching here. Um, what are the five qualities? Now we're going to look at. This is your curriculum for the day. This is your teaching for the day. Five qualities of an effective leader. Five qualities of a justice leader. Five qualities of an indigenous leadership developer. Let's look at those qualities. Number one, you got to be yourself. Be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. She 
was acting like a Persian. She was not a Persian. She was a Jew. You got to be yourself. That's number one. Don't be an actor. Uh, leadership development is helping the person to find themselves in the process, to find what God has created them to be. Don't pattern your life completely after somebody else. Try to discover why God created you. What did you come into the world for? And so you got to find yourself in the process, and then that development takes place. You begin then to love yourself. You can love others now deeply. So you've got to learn how to communicate clearly. Uh, don't try to appear to be somebody else. Uh, I think it's Socrates who said, know yourself, know yourself, know yourself. That's number one. That's important. Number two, you got to be able to communicate concisely. Now, concisely has to do with that you are communicating the correct message that needs to be communicated. There's a lot of folks who communicate these days, but as I go to churches and listen to communication, it is a little bit of substance. It's a little bit of substance. It, it is not the clear message. Most of the time, it's a self-interest message, self-interest message. And so you got to be able to communicate concisely exactly what you want people to know and what you want them to do in, in life. And so Mordecai, we're going to see that Mordecai was able to do that. He had to help her to find herself. He taught her how to know herself. And when he sent out a message that she was a Jew, she knew who she was. He communicated the message concisely uh, to her. Number three, you got to be able to make timely decisions. Timely decisions. A leader cannot procrastinate. That's a burden of a leader. A leader's got to know how to make decisions timely, timely in, in, in society. And so he, now was the time. She couldn't procrastinate. A few more days, all the Jews will be dead. And so she's got to uh, make that decision now. Now's the time. Now's the time for us. You know, for the last few years, I've been going around these colleges and universities, Wheaton College and all these other colleges, and I've been seeing that God was raising up a covenant college, many of these colleges. I've been seeing that God is raising up a whole generation of young people who know nothing very much about the past, racism and other things. I've been affirming them in that. I, I'm telling them that all of that was wrong and bad. Now let's see what kind of world we want to make today. And there's a whole young generation of young people is ready to reflect the kingdom of God here on earth. And I know a whole new thought in my generation. In the last four years, you are hearing kingdom, 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 kingdom talk. And you get that kingdom talk from looking at the book of Revelation and seeing in the kingdom there is people there from every nation, every tongue, every language singing joy together here on earth. And so we, we, this is an exciting time for us, the leaders. It's an exciting time for us to uh, turn this leadership now over to this generation as fast as we can and as, and as responsible as we can to let this new leadership of today. Because last night, boy, I, it was a good time. But you know, I didn't understand a word they were saying. And, and, and when the rapper got through rapping, I felt a little good because he said, Jesus. I said, <laughs> you, you, you know, so, so we, we, need to, we need to raise up another generation to communicate to this generation, to this generation, because they was over my head last, uh, uh, last, last night. And, and, and so... Uh, you, 
Number, number, number four here. Number, we got five. Number four. We got to define our goals very well. Our goals must be defined. I, I meet, as I said before, I'm meeting all these people who want to want to start a 501c thing, do something, a ministry. I got a ministry. God didn't call me to a ministry, and they have no goals. The goal is you let them, and they're independent. The goal is you let them, and them want to do something to satisfy their own ego. It has very little to do with really doing something creatively for the people. It is something they want to be in charge of want to be in charge of. And so they got to be able, we, we talked about communicating uh, clearly, and then we talked about, uh, what did we talk about here? Making decisions. We talked then about finding a goal. He had a goal. His goal was just one step, and that goal was to save his people. And then the essential of a leader is that they got to be able to develop people. She said, if I perish, I perish. And the whole idea of a leader has the ability to develop peoples to a level of self-confidence and that they carry it out where their own life is secondary to what God has called them to be. Uh, these are the, these are the, um, the overriding principles of a leader. These are the qualities that a leader must have. Now, let me conclude with this here. Leaders then must develop a philosophy of life of their own, of their own. Your philosophy of life, the way you live, should be the joy that motivates you. Understand why you're doing, understanding yourself, and then you've got to be able to sing your music in the bathroom. Your philosophy of life is you singing to yourself. They are the principles that you live by. And if people don't have principles to live by, that guides them, they must be the guiding principles of your own life in order to be an effective leader. And let me go through these um, principles, this philosophy of life, right quick. Uh, number one in this, you got to have purpose. Purpose. Know why you are doing what you are doing. Purpose is, 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 purpose horns us in. It helps us to see. And we got to know how this purpose relates to the people in the great need. Not a purpose for me. Purpose. Purpose helps you to delay your instant gratification. Purpose. Purpose is always future. It's always had to do with future in, in life. Not just the now, but future. Once you get purpose, then you get passion. Uh, you know, I said that yesterday about Bill, the definition that Bill Hyber gave of the leader. He says a leader is a person who's able to turn vision into passion. Passion. And so passion is an invisible but seeable product. Uh, when people meet you, you passion calls you to persuade people to follow you because they see that you love them. Passion is the best part of you reaching out to others. Whenever Jesus got ready to perform a miracle, he would say something like, many times, he would see people suffering, and it says compassion went out of him. The good Samaritan, the Bible says, he had compassion on that person, and he went to him. Passion is that which pulls you to other people and put other people, uh, well, passion really puts the other person equal with yourself. Passion is, is that you see somebody in misery and you imagine that your, yourself was in that situation. And that draws you to that. To, passion is when uh, a house is on fire and a mother's down there and five of her kids are upstairs. What the policeman and the fireman's got to do is hold that woman. Otherwise, she would be up there and burn up with those children because her passion is up there. Her passion is up there. Passion is that force in you that draws you to other. And then that passion must be for people. 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 Passion is not for things. We use things. We use things. Our passion is for people. And finally, in last, you got to know 
absolutely why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. The whole idea of God's creating of humanity and the reason that he saved us, the reason he created us, the reason he went by his grace and redeemed us is because we was created for the praise of his glory. We was created for the praise of his glory. God has called us to glory. Don't be ashamed of that. God has called us to glory. He has called us to share in his glory. He created us for the praise of his glory. There's a biblical thought in the Bible that says when one person comes to Jesus Christ and embrace him as Savior, all heaven breaks out in a joyful tune in heaven. God created us. He saves us for his own glory. That will restrain our ego. That ought to restrain us. We ought to know why we are doing it. We ought to know that glory is coming. You, we ought to know that God is pleased with us. We ought to know that in our work. And so my prayer is this morning, my prayer is this, for CC Day and for all of you as you go back home, uh, go back home and make disciples. Go back home and make disciples. Jesus called us to be his disciples. He called us to go back to the neighborhood and raise up disciples. Let's pray. Well, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to have an, I got something to say a minute after I pray. So, so, uh, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we could be here. And we pray that you would take these feeble words and apply them to the hearts of your people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see, before we break, I've been thinking about, I'm 78 years old, and we've been thinking about this sometime. Ten years ago, Gordy said that we got to help you to live another ten years, and God has been good now. Clear mind. With a clear mind. And Vera May said it was not quite. <laughs> Vera May said she don't know whether or not all of that has been fulfilled or not. <laughs> uh, she said that. Uh, uh, and, and how can I use the remainder of my time? I, and naturally, I can't travel as much as I used to. Uh, this last hospital stay, you know, I realize now I'm an old man. And going up and down these steps, I can't do that as much as I want, need to. And all an old man like me got to do is fall and break something. And that's sort of the end of that. You know, from then on, it's downhill. And what we thought about doing and what we are doing is the whole more workshop with a select group of leaders back in Jackson, instead of me going to talk to everybody, some of those groups. And what we want to do is that you plan your development, and you're thinking about your leadership. What I'd like to do is be involved with you in that, and that you bring your leadership team, bring your group down, and that we got this retreat center. It's a very, you need to pick up some uh, information about it. God has blessed us with this unique, beautiful retreat center that will hold about 12 to 15 people and that we can come there and stay three days with your leadership and some of you can do a little work but we can also, the big deal will be this, not so much work for these retreats, not so much work, it's only your work, it's not so much physical work I mean, is that we want to help people go over their plans together and then we want to teach them some of the principles of leadership and some of the principles of, uh, of development, Christian community development. What we really want to do is to try to fulfill Paul's admonition to Timothy. That which you have heard of me and learned from me, that commit unto faithful men and women who shall be able to teach others also. Pick up some information about this out there. And we envision uh, this retreat center uh, being there, we'll schedule a time. I will be still be doing some traveling, going to strategic gathering, but I will not just be coming to do your banquet. 
I will not just be coming to, uh, you know, to do those little things, but I really want to, I want to do the little things here at the center and then uh, go out to speak to those selective groups who can further the ministry of the Christian Community Development Association. Thank you all for listening to me this morning. Good morning, Miami. We're so blessed to have Dr. Perkins lead us in Bible study every morning, aren't we? Well, I was told that I ignore the right-hand side, so I'm going to do my best with my left hand to throw these out. Get you. Oh, my gosh. All right, this way, this way. I don't play Frisbee. All right. All right, well, we're going to have you stand up, stretch, get your holy kiss on. So for three minutes, we'll take a break and uh, come back and worship with Foster and go right into t this morning's session. <laughs> 